starting recording. So welcome to the April 30th meeting of the OSE Dev Team. Uh, so we've got a few good updates here and continue with the work. So uh, the current meeting is on the current meeting page, uh, naturally. And that is on the wiki. It's at the page called current meeting. <coughs> and click edit to get in there so it's live editable anyone can edit this document okay so today i'm gonna uh, talk about a couple of things working on a 3d printer continued uh, primarily the heat bed and i'll do a little presentation regarding um what it takes to start up the 3d printer on first print just to get clarified up proceed because it's actually very easy right now at this point we're able to pretty much Build printer according to all the procedures, and when we have done everything according to the steps, the first print you can actually level the bed automatically during the process in real time, so that that prevents you from having multiple tries with which you have, you try to get the first layer sticking correctly. So it's it's very convenient right now. We'll go over that. And the last thing I talk about is 3D printed circuits, um, which is relevant to the ascent down. So once again, talking about a cordless drill, um, where that's going to be a massive open source and ascent challenge that I'm working on with my mentor. Uh, <clears throat> just designing all of that, but it's a perfect project for a 3D printed printable product that we can get actually towards industrial grade. So very serious, um, high quality stuff. Okay, so let's start with the printer, the 3D. Printer. So, so I put up a new page called D3D 1904. Uh, let me share my screen here so you guys can see what I'm looking at. Okay, so you can see the page. D3D 1904, so you can take a look at that. There's a full part library. So getting now really detailed to the very, very specifics of every single part broken down <clears throat> by parts and some design rationale, documents, work documents. But here you see the printer. Uh, so get very detailed and now I set up a whole section for the heat bed. There's a bunch of parts there. Uh, so you got frame, you got the printer proper and then you've got the extruder parts, the control panel parts. You have to finish up the control panel. Um, with the one thing I pointed out, I do believe I mentioned the GFEI outlet as a thing I talked about that last time, where um, as a safety feature, like an ultimate safety feature, I was, I was thinking, okay, a lot of people can replicate this. Um, just as a pattern for future, any electronic devices that we want to make, I think I'd like to put in a GFCI breaker. In other words, it's it's like a ground line that actually works better. It, it prevents you from getting shocked. Ground lines prevent you from getting shocked, typically. Uh, GFCI is pretty much definitely prevents you from getting shocked. If you think about, you know, lots of people doing this and maybe inexperienced people uh, uh, making sure that we don't hurt anybody in the um, uh, permanent future of this project. So it's, it's just a thing that, well, if I think about power electronics, which the printer is not really a power electronics device, um, but starting right here, there is this the is yeah, there is the mission of the graphite circuit interrupter. To uh, I'd like to put it as a standard feature of what we're offering, and just just to be radical, but safe, really promote that. Okay, V three D nineteen oh four, continuing. So you can see the old CAD. And it's still in progress. The latest update is the heat. Let's look at this crazy thing. Now, this is why it actually took me a day to do. Um, it's insulated heat bed. You can click on a, on a link for what it's about. The general idea is you have insulation. So you've got your PI surface, you've got both plate of metal, um, and get a heater, a nichrome heater, DIY, so the scale of 20 size, and insulation. Okay, this is what we're seeing here. Insulation is goes inside here. Now I made all these slits in here to make this thing faster to print. I'll tell you about that. And there's one little. So the way this works is this is attached to the the heated bed holding rods, just like on the current printer. 
Next up, we have the snapping, uh, what do you call it, like buckle connector. So these bubbles, they snap into these four holes here where you see the arrows. They snap into the small holes. The holes are 8 by 12 millimeters. There's four of them total. So if I were to draw how the rods go under the bed here, they'd be like, like this here. Um, now you want a rod. <clears throat> and that'll be the second rod, like right here. They'll be under the bed. But but this these buckles snap into the structure of the holder of the bed here, and then the rod mounts into this circular hole here. So that you basically you want you can build bed as a module and then snap it onto the rods. So this simplifies kind of edges like Eric, I know you've been saying how you make the bed a little easier to put on, so it's more f uh, without using the gluing stuff we've done before. So here's a way to do it. Um, the insulation goes into this. This is one and a half inches of insulation. I'm thinking of rock wool uh, or fiberglass. Rock wool, I think, seems to me it's less. It's less busty. It's actually higher temperature rock wool. You can actually use a fireplace where fiberglass insulation would melt. So we actually are using rock wool in the front door insulation of the OSC Seed Eco Home uh, hydronic stove where you're talking about flames and it does melt under. Uh, so we're using rock wool insulation under stove. So let's use it here in the 3 printer for a product ecology. Um, now here's this one trick. So this is, you know, like, wow, this is advanced. And what's crazy about it is this one, one trick for how do you print this bed if this thing has an 8 in print surface on the top using the same printer? Well, so basically the bed is going to span the entire top. It's a, the off-the-shelf bed are actually 8.4 inches or 240 millimeters. Well, you couldn't have you print a holder that actually clamps on the bed where the this holder, this insulated heat bed holder is actually a little larger than 8 inches. Well, so I, I just bend the sides because you see the tabs. The tabs are for offsets for there's going to be bulk going in there to offset the bed so the bed is not touching the plastic because the bed is going to be hot. Uh, so there's little offset things here which make this about 8 point more like 9 inches uh, across. So in order to print a 9 inch structure on an 8 inch bed flat, I bend these things in so you can print so that fits an 8 inch space. But then you can take a heat gun, just take heat on this and then bend these sides back out so they go out to 9 inches. So I haven't done that yet, but that sounds cool, right? That's it's called like telltale joint woodwork or something right. like that. Yeah. Right, you could also do a dovetail if you print this in multiple pieces, like, like a snap and dovetail kind of a thing. But the idea here was, well, let's try to print this in one piece, so there's only one part instead of like four parts or, you know, or three parts. So, I think that's a, that's cool. I look forward to testing that, see how it looks. Um, yeah. But, I, I, I well, I mean, yeah, I heard my experience before, like when you take a heat onto plastic, like the plastic is pretty soft, but the heat just makes it uh, soft and right up, and you can bend it. So you, you take the heat gun, just blast it along the edge, bend it up, and there you go. So I think that's it. We'll try it in the next day or two. Anything else you want to add to that, John? Oh, no, no that, that's all. It looks so good. And uh, you know, I was going to say, um, you access to the page. Um, for security, I can't uh, log into the. Oh, sorry. I just uh, like got uh, Okay. So I want to. Sorry. To change that public on the web. Anyone can edit that. Okay. Thanks. Uh, uh, that. Thank you. See you. Super exciting. Something like that. That and the uh, some, like the uh, ejector or something. I've been made good progress on it. That I'm not sure that later on. Yeah. Uh, um, What's interesting here, let me actually download, I, I want to actually uh, show you in the free CAD what we got here. Uh, so insulated heat bed, or more like D319.2 so I'm gonna, I want to show you a couple of other features about this heat bed, actually there's some uh, more intricacy there, so there it is. 
Um, let's download that and open it up. So I just want to show uh, a couple more details. So if you look at it, there's another little feature here. So you see this thing uh, with a little hole, right? right. So the be wires for the nichrome heat bed inside here with the insulation this is a uh, basically a lock for the wires so the wires are going to come in like around here underneath that and then there's a nut catcher and that's a nut catcher and a bolt in here oops i forgot to put a hole in there for the bolt to go through um but that's in the catch so that once you put you put the wire in the gap there and then the wire escapes out this little hole here so that the wire that goes to the control panel uh this little clamp it pitches down a wire so the wire does not slip in and out. I thought it might be a good idea. So, like, oh, in, in case you pull pull on it, you're not gonna yank out the nichrome heater. It's inside here, so it's another kind of a safety thing, just to make sure that everything, clean wiring, is very stable. So that's that's the idea there. Um, all the slots in there. I mean, the slots here are so you can bend back easily. It's like a perforation, like a cut on a piece of paper. So. Yeah, why not? That I mean, uh, view perspective view. Uh, if you look in, look in there, you could see like holes of daylight. Um, so it's essentially perforation. So it's very easy then to bend it back into shape. All the other holes are just, just holes, so you have less material. And I'm proud of these little snapping. So this this hole here, uh, this here. This, this, on the other side, on the corresponding side, this hole here and this hole here, that's where the snap in. Oh my goodness. Yeah. It took it me. The rods. Yeah. Yeah, the rods that you can build the. Uh, you can build the heat bed completely independently, then snap it on right onto the, the Z mounts, the, the Z, uh, basically the, the bed mounts using those little clips, that I, these clips, where Rod goes in there. So, um, very modular. I like it. Now, why put all the holes in there? Well, for one, uh, to save material. Like, this is like half the, like, half printing. But it takes four hours and 40 minutes to print this using a 0.8 millimeter nozzle. That's what I have on um, D3 D1802. Now, if you go to a 0.4 nozzle, it goes to 18 hours. And if it weren't with the slots, it would be like 36 hours. So it's just time. So right. reduce the time with a bigger nozzle. If you, if the smaller features are fine, their nozzle is fine. It's precision uh, isn't you know wholly required here. Um, there's, there's very few features that have a uh, fit. Besides right. The, you know, right. I have to do some engineering on the fit for the rods. But other than that, for a large part, like this, uh, yeah. something that I have is. Uh, Maybe I've been experimenting seeing some people adding uh, small VS in the bottom of prints. Mm -hmm. uh, so, like, you can a huge object because having enough hair is that uh, it can stick to the bed. So, your first layer is good, but then having a sort of way you can peel it off the bed. Oh, but yeah. If you're PI, maybe you don't have to worry about that here. This is kind of getting it so large that I start to get concerned about that. Oh, yeah. Get it off. yeah. No, if PI, and it won't. I don't see a lot of material there. So triple you take it off yeah that problem which you just said that's that's pretty much be i get rid of that issue because once it cools off i mean right. once you get it get your knife under corner the thing just pops right off because um, it cools it has that in the pei you know physically it has a little bit of exchange and retraction yeah. physically that's, right. that's why i didn't look in that recently i think that's how we experienced she could um yeah yeah, that's exactly the mechanisms of differential contraction. Like the, the PEI will contract a different amount than the plastic itself. And when it contracts, it much breaks off. All the bonds. Yeah, all the bonds just break off. Yeah. So that's cool. Um, and uh, and just like the last last thing here. So there are all these, these little things. Uh, I wanted to get stand-ups and I was thinking, okay, uh, 
What about like ceramic stands so you don't melt this because it's plastic and it's insulated so the heat's not gonna travel to the bottom but what about like we're touching like on these uh the top edges here well the answer to that is uh using our one quarter inch screws or six millimeter screws just screw that right in so have offsets and then put a wire clip on it just people typically put that on uh, so, so the, you screw the screw in from the bottom, that's the hole for it, so you can insert the screw. Um, and then the screw sticks out here, so you're offset from not touching the plastic with the uh, metal surface, metal print surface. That's just the detail. Uh, but I think that's a good, good thing, so you don't you add any other parts into the bill of materials. You just use the existing 16 millimeter long and six screws without having to use any other, other things in here. Okay. So I'll end on that. Um, last thing, uh, 3D printed circuits. Uh, so this is relevant with respect to 3D printing in general because um, the idea on the left here, I mean, look at that. I think that's a powerful application of 3D printing to mixing electronics on there because you can then print structures in 3D and attach all your electronic components to that. So that's perfect for the cordless drill. Imagine having all those components that are kind of built in and at the regular geometry as opposed to having to fit a, a flat, awkward board inside a cordless drill, right? So you can, you can make spaces for the comp electronic components, say you've got a speed controller or a charger, like a charger. Inside the, the drill, you only have like a speed controller, but but that's some electronics. If, if we're using a brushless DC motor, a speed controller is electronics. So we have a little MOSFET and maybe something comparable to this and the components. Um, but that's cool. The, the, the circuit, the printed circuit, essentially gets you a place to hang all your components. And that's saying that's what a circuit board does. And then the other side, you can make side connections. You can also make other if you click on the 3D printed circuits, there's some advantages you get from the idea of a 3D printed uh, circuit. And that is on the back of this, you can, you can print channels that literally like hold all the wires in place. So for one, soldering is super easy. Or in the second case, if you, if you 3D print a channel, you can yeah. make a physical connection by doing something like inserting a solid copper wire into a hole which will like pinch connect two other elements. It's kind of a little bit hard to discover. But imagine printing a channel which just fits a say a gauge ten copper wire. So just snap in that wire and it locks in whatever the wire is underneath that. So You got that. Yeah. <laughs> You like that? So that way, yeah. so that way, you're talking about a hundred percent design for the assembly circuit. You don't have even soldered anything. So this is completely in line with the lifetime module of design, where we OSC will take back all our products to recycle all the components hundred percent. We don't need, need solder in a thing like that. So that's that's quite encouraging. It just kind of occurred to me that. You know, you can think about all these more complex things like plating copper onto plastic, which is also doable, and then milling that. But uh, necessary. I mean, for bulk components like power electronics, 3D printing by itself already does the job. And we're all like, if you look at this, yeah. Um, look at the. We look at the terminal block. That can be 3D printed too. Here it's not 3D printed, but that could be 3D printed. So you have, you have a way to connect wires and clamp them down just using regular screws and little metal pieces. So, so this is really, really cool. And then uh, just to go over some of the other things that are possible, like take a look at the this kind of chip. Is, this is actually a small Arduino. <laughs> it's a baby Arduino. Basically with an Arduino where you have a little circuit board that everything else is soldered to it. And that actually works like a little tiny you know. Uh, I mean, I have some issues about having pins to connect to. I mean, you can still connect to them. But but thinking about like these, um, it's called, I, I looked this up, this kind of style of circuit making where you put like chips upside down and start soldering in there. It's called a uh, debug soldering for the chips looking like bugs in our back. 
Um, so uh, yeah. I think that's gonna be awesome. It did that, that, that bug and uh you know also another design and just cloud like my hands and load. So I think got my like put the push pin things that yeah. cool. make the cloak and push pin. Mm-hmm. And the uh other thing I really like about this that one capture so people who watch this can consider it's for SMA topologies with the uh, small features that a three American prints, they can find a sweetly non resistive conductive filament, which normally is un- unsuitable ohms, <laughs> hundred kilo ohms or whatnot, not resistance. But we can find that I, I like to consider a task where we print out the uh, surface pad for an SMA component, surface mount component. Mm-hmm. And place a surface mount component on board, and then place a perhaps a metal sheet on top of all the ICs. And then use pressure, push, and push down push on that board to press that SMA component against those the pad, the conductor pad, which would achieve a um, you know, do SMA. In this environment, I, mean, I think that that could be so cool. Like even, you're saying that even like conductive paste or like just something that's not super conductive, but conductive enough could work enough. Yeah, yeah, it's yeah. not conductive enough because you can kind of make a, a, a bridge or bump because you're 3D printing. You're not doing other stuff that you can fully press and SD components like that are like that much work. You know how it's not a three wheel part and you press it down. You can bend those pins up a bit, and if you have a metal shape or something pushing down enough pressure, now you have electrical cobbling to that yeah. small IC, and yeah. you can have the three things you know, can place it. And then you just kind of have these components not even soldered in, but the pill in place is some really interesting things. You you're saying uh, the 3D press yeah. also uses mechanical support, so you kind of like snap in your components? Yeah. It might be a thing. Yeah. There's just a whole bunch of just things we can do in the team with non through hole parts and then also you know we even do through hole um you know we're aware of robotic processes that do a technique known as a wire wrapping you're familiar with that uh-huh um, yeah we just wire wires around the connectors there's ro- yeah there's robot arms that could do that mm-hmm. and uh you know, just rapidly deploy wire wrapping routine between through all components that port and it's very, you know, consistent yeah. to pick and place, place them. Then. But yeah, I mean, there's a lot of yeah. ways that you can do this to be great. That's interesting. So a third example of what uh, related to this uh, is this 3D printed drone where it's um, the three prints have built-in electronics in them and they're printed. I think they use this kind of a dual head 3D printer, let me actually go back to this. I put a page on the wiki called Circuit on Plastic. Because with 3D printing, it's, you know, it lends itself to that. So, uh, look at all those different routes. Circuits on Plastic, uh, snap together 3D printed electronic modules. So, there's one company, Nano Racing, uh, they produce these mini racing drones, um, but they have no glue, no screws, no glue. So the 3D printing, they embed the 3D printed circuits and components into the 3D prints and they just snap the different components together. That's just another example of like embedded electronics into 3D printing. So I think, I think it's cool. If you want to see other examples of kind of things you can go with, I mean, there's a lot of different things I was trying to stick to. Like, like this example here of just plain 3D printed holders for components, you can go a long way with that already. Uh, and then, of course, advanced with copper on plastic, um, like where you're actually coating the plastic. And there's a, there's a good thing on Hackaday, you can click on that. Uh, depositing copper onto plastic is a home, homebrewed way where you can do it's not electroplating, it's actually electroless. But you basically put on, uh, you can get solutions where you can get uh, a solution essentially of, of copper um, that will bond to plastic. There's a bunch of steps involved in that, but you know, that's kind of complicated here. This is like right there, you already have the circuit, and as long as you can make the connections easily on the back, you're pretty good. So that's. Uh, that's it. Now the advantage of, I mentioned the dead bug soldering, was reading about 
um, advantages of this high frequency circuits because you have all copper traces and you're making connections pretty directly. It's actually very good for radio frequency or high frequency circuits where capacitive effects of there being metal uh, or leads being long that causes enough interference or capacitive coupling or induction between components that you get like uh, funny signals into a circuit at very high frequencies. So it's actually for very high frequency stuff, which is just interesting if it, we ever get into making radio equipment, <laughs> uh, maybe in the future. But okay, so that's about it uh, on my side. So I'll, I'll quit it that um, with updates on my side. So maybe go on to the people. Uh, Abe, you want to continue? Abe, can you hear us? I can't hear you if you're talking. Abe, Abe's muted. Uh, can you can you hear me now? Are you telling me my uh, audio quality is a little lower? Um, yeah, you're good. Okay. Um, just been working on some CAD uh, already this morning, so uh, I, I did kind of get a space for a 3D printer shelf installed and things like that. Um, and uh, I'm just trying to get back to figuring out all the details on the uh, uh, get the CAD kind of assembled better. And uh, I noticed a little issue there. It seems like something isn't quite aligned on the uh, uh, the clamps again with the axes, but I'm trying to rework that. Uh, get that thumbs up. Uh, because I figured that there's a few things that probably need to be checked. At least the three printed parts need to be uh, as accurate. But I figured there's also a bunch of things that um, I need to start looking at. Uh, I've been looking at the other, I looked at the uh, so the printer manual and uh, the bombs and stuff like that. To figure out what. Uh, so if I probably just start uh, getting a list of things to, to where whatever needs to be done. Uh, things that are that are going to be static for a printer anyway. I mean, all the, most of the parts are, you know, going to be the same. And I don't think that I want to make changes to the um, to the printed plastic parts so much. Uh, I think the only thing that I had to be adjusted to get the assembly roughly is just the rod length, but it looks like that might need to be adjusted again for some reason. I'm not sure where I got off from the just to change to with the plastic because it doesn't look like it's quite lining pad again, but um, I don't think it was the three corners, but I think those are supposed to be the same size effectively, but um, it, it stuff can be shifted around uh, on most parts to get that to align correctly again, but <clears throat> um, I think I think you talked before you said you had a lot of parts uh, yeah. you'd be interested in getting rid of on that, so I may, may email you like, some more or something and we can talk about that more Yeah. Uh, to get kind of started on uh, figuring out what uh, the ideal parts are for a small printer yep uh, figured that, that small, small is good kitchen to test. Um, I just kind of start with the limits of that. Mm -hmm. I figure being together just like a frame to begin with, and um, uh, and then and then you know seeing how well that does, the speed it will have a lot of software catch up to learn. So um, thoroughly kind of test. What it can do. I mean, speed speed will be the the I guess the test issue. Maybe try to reinforce in the frame, of course, and all that. But um, if I compare some things. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, on this, if you talk about the speed and fill in the frame at this level, that would be a really valuable test if you were to get around to that. Yeah.
Yeah, breaking up a little. Um, I was saying that testing would be good. Uh, testing the frame stiffness uh, with a reinforced frame, like putting concrete inside the frame or something like that. Because um, concrete yeah. is, I like, you know, the more I study concrete, I actually like it because uh, it seems that it's as simple as, as you take limestone and bake it. You gotta heat it, and you got concrete essentially. So concrete can be quite sustainable if you have access to limestone. Basically, you grind rock and bake it at a cost of kilowatt hour per kilogram. That's not too bad. Yeah, concrete is a is a nice material. I've worked with it quite a bit. Um, but I'm, I'm sure there's other uh, materials. Of, did anything would harden up in there. Yeah. Um, so I'm gonna see how that stiffen that uh, I think I guess I should get some comparison ideas on the parts um, what's good for the uh, small model printer that kind of stuff next um, I, yeah. I've looked in the uh, printer manual bit, so I just gotta do a lot of catch up on that but have, and, have you thought about the assembly which is have you thought about um, what kind of extra to use on this Yeah, I guess the extruder selection, I guess that's the main thing, and it's probably good to start with um, something simple, I guess all kinds of stuff can be changed up, I'm sure. I, a lot of people, it sounds like people usually end up wanting to operate stuff. You know, that's not hard, and yeah. uh, I can like the uh, volume. I, volume's nice, but precision is important too, especially if it's a smaller printer than mostly what you can do. Printing is, is small parts that are probably higher precision. Yeah. Um, I think I saw that uh, I saw a printer that doesn't use filament. I think post about that was interesting, oh, yeah. but then it's totally uh, that's a large scale thing there. That's different. You just All put right. the plastic in it. Um, Interesting, and just to recycle trash quick, but I, it's hard to get everything all in one. I guess that, that's always the issue. It's not a universal uh, uh, device that's easy to use. Yeah, where did, where did I put that out? Yeah, I should actually point that out. <clears throat> you remember where I had that? It's got to not put, um, maybe it was in. Uh... Yeah, because was so that's that's work by Sam Smith, and uh, he's been here, so he's he developed that basically um, use pellets or basically ground up plastic to do that. Let's see. Um, oh, did I put that on Wiki? Let's see. And, um, pallet 3D printer. Yeah, the short of it is that Sam Smith, who's in Oregon, he made up a printer that uses an auger screw. So you're feeding it with, with round plastic, and he's using the precious plastic shredder to grind the plastic. Um, so that's really compelling stuff. Um, I will show that. Well, let me I'll go into my Gmail here to load up that because it's worth worth seeing. I was thinking we can potentially do that with an, um, the soap of the summer school, but Sam wasn't able to come to this, so I don't think we can do it. It's a little bit of a learning curve to, to get that working. Um, well, let's see, Sam Smith. This is the hard part uh, doing things like that is uh, that it's not um, <clears throat> it's easy to put maybe on a, on a universal axis that is uh, like the head is swappable probably because that that bulk system uh, just looks a lot heavier and there's a lot more power, I assume, too. So 
Okay. Heart, it's, it didn't look like it's necessarily something you could make into a, a system that you could swap heads on a, uh, a small, uh, you know, universal access system and so on. Yeah. But I said I'm looking at it closer. I didn't. Uh, yeah. So that's. I didn't see details on that. Right. There's a video on it. He's got uh, designs within uh, SketchUp, which I asked him to uh, get like step files or something we could import into FreeCAD or even SDLs. Um, but yeah, this the good part is that he's actually doing it and he's getting useful things. Out of it. But as you said, now it's. I mean, it's quite limited. I mean, in terms of the kind of precision you can get for extrusion. Uh, I mean, when you're shooting with an auger. It's, you've got this big molten mass in there, and it's not going to be super precise, so, so it's limited, but you can certainly do large-scale prints where you don't care about the quality of the, you know, you, you care that it's off by a millimeter or two, and it's like, you get like a couple, a couple of millimeter precision, where, as you see here, it's, uh, you know, it's not exactly super accurate, but for bulk components such as, you know, say, plastic, um, like, Plastic wood composites, where you're putting large architectural components like trusses or whatever. Sure. And then yeah. We have shipping boxes, thing of open source shipping boxes. Yeah. We ship around trades instead of cardboard packaging, all that stuff. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. And you see in, in his uh, example, I mean, it, the, the motion is very, very slow because I mean, you can only control it so well and so so. so but yeah, definitely. Uh, worth doing it's you know it's it's working it's working for him and he's printing straight out of ground up trash so that's that's a great accomplishment for sam and um for when we could do it uh but without the support of getting all the uh, all the details on that yeah i wouldn't do it right now because you know probably a lot of figuring out in there just getting used to how that system works so let me paste that link into the jitsi meet there uh, so you can take a look at that video. Um, here it is in the chat box. I'll put in. Uh, uh, let's see. Do we have a note slide? Put it in notes there. Sam Smith extruder screw. Printer extruder. What do you call it? Call it a pellet 3D printer. That's kind of what they call it. Pellet based extruder. Um, but technically, it's, it's an extruder with an extruder screw that does the pushing instead of filament that's being pushed by drive gears. Uh, yeah. Um, good. Uh, I would suggest, uh, Abe, if you have access, do you have access to a drill press and tapping? Uh, I mean, it would be good if you made a simple extruder that just tap and, like, according to the simple design where, um, where is it? It's, it's called simple extruder, I think, I'm like, um, sim 3D printer extruder, yeah, that's the work by, uh, William Neal. OSC chapter in the London International Academy OSC Club. So, so this is the basic design you have here. You can go through the... Abe, have you seen that page there? A simple 3D printer extruder. It's, you want to take a look at... This is basically like all the parts you need, plus a little aluminum block that you would have to cut and then drill and tap. This is essentially the here block here. So you'd have to drill it and tap it if you want to do a low cost um yeah so this is this is like the little heater block so, so there's a decent documentation it's, it's worth doing so if you want to take a look at that it's an option for you know cost you a couple of dollars plus stepper order to to build that so that's that all right um Let's continue. With anything else? I'm having a hard time hearing. I'm gonna refresh real quick. Okay.
Yeah, hey, Benny, anything else, or, or that's it, or side? Okay, I think I fixed my audio, <laughs> or my connection issue, it must have been a jitsy window. Mm -hmm. um, I can hear a little better now. Um, oh, on the pre-connection, I think, um, I saw where you said that the, uh, uh, the linear uh, pattern in, in free can be kind of slow, and oh, yes. that, that had been usually my experience, too. I think it's more of a software issue, and I actually tried to load that file in um, this in point 0.17. It didn't quite look like it was working in point 0.17. First thought it was faster, but it, it just wasn't working quite right. But um, that, for some, something with the software and the linear pattern, I don't know if there's... Mm, yeah. Bugs, or if it's just the nature of that that code, it may be slower there. But that's the way it was to do the linear patterns. Um, yeah. Sometimes it almost seems like it's worth it. Just to, if you don't have a big linear pattern, it almost be with it to uh, draw in a and drop multiple copies of parts in the sketch just to still sketch sometimes. But yeah, it's much uh, faster to do some that. Reason, so. that that's, I give up on a pattern, linear yeah. patterns, and I just did it by hand, like, at the end, so... Takes a lot of time to do a sketch that way, too, but, um... But usually it wasn't so bad, but what was bad, I noticed on the linear pattern stuff was usually, if you're not careful about how you type the numbers in there, it constantly tries to re-update, there's kind of a bug that way in data entry, uh... Yeah, yes, on -click the, the, the update. Linear pattern, it would kind of cause problems for me that way but right so there i don't know that it's like i don't know if it'd be solved by a, a higher performance uh system or something like that if we can i don't know yeah because i was after i saw it i was like oh man i need to get me like a, de a desktop computer to work effectively but maybe yeah well that would help because this is like a laptop that's not particularly new so but it's been working fine but i was just surprised that on a thing that's just got one object is that the file that he did but right now is just a symbol uh one object and it was giving me trouble with one object so i was like what's going on here um so um, I still want to look into getting like a GPU computer, like a desktop, for much faster work on free because because it still will still work with pretty simple files. And when I do the printer, for example, here I'm keeping that by simplifying it, keeping it under one meg, uh, and then the full VL file that he did had enclosure here that actually was two megabytes. So if you cut the source files that are not stripped of the sketches, it's two meg. It's pretty big. Anyway, because it's got all the little cuts in there. Um, yeah, and it's, that's a you know, on the free cut performance that you bring up, Abe. Um, but yet, still like to fall off. I'm probably getting a dedicated workstation for free cuts and stuff. You know, common tool. It's a bread and butter operation for everything, like especially here. Like architecture uh, with free cut, which is uh, quite doable. Started doing that, frankly, right? Very architecture. Which is what we would do. Okay, um, hey, is that all or anything else? Okay, um, so anyone else? So John or Rick? John? Uh, I can hop in for a minute. Okay. So, so uh, I spend some time to better understand um, the new uh, extruder setup using the Titan and I guess modified with the arrow um, sync. Um, mm -hmm. That looks like a pretty cool design. Um, so I uh, ordered parts to, um, I ordered a uh, Titan, Titan extruder with the uh, arrow um, heat sink. I got a, a knockoff off eBay. It was supposedly all metal, um, so we'll see how that goes. Um, how much was but, it? Yeah, I, it was uh, six, 65, it was 10 bucks, I think. Yeah, that's good. So tighten there, or you had that with the little drive hog? Uh, well, it's shipping, um, yeah. coming from 
China, I believe. Yeah, so, yeah. Uh, I it's think going to take a couple of weeks. I think that's decent because, in any case, like I don't think that's a bad option. I mean, they I followed the discussion that they they seem to be making them properly with in terms of hard hard to drive gear, which is which is good. And when you get those parts anyway, a lot of them, I mean, they're all from there. Like, most of the parts are from there, except what they're yeah. building out. So, it's like, when you get a Chinese clone versus the original, it's like, you can't really tell what the boundary is. Um, you know, so it, it should be okay, as long as you understand what you're working with. It should be quite good. Um, yeah, I have um, the authentic uh, hot end. So... Uh, with volcano uh, nozzle, mm -hmm. so I think I'll uh, put that on there, um, and then I have the nozzle assembly printed, um, and I ordered uh, the um, the uh, sensor, the uh, inductive sensor, mm -hmm. and um, there was uh, one other uh, oh, floor fan. So those are all um, in row. Um, and uh, I added a sheet to the uh, of materials for my um, extruder project. Um, but I'll, I'll make sure that those are all updated. I think uh, I might need some additional screws or just the screw that holds the uh, inductive sensor in place. Um, I know that's just uh, kind of like a commodity M, M8, something like that. Uh, M6, um, yeah, or just um, M6. If you're using the one that from 1902. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. No, that's uh, once again, low part count. I'm not putting anything new, I'm trying to reuse everything. So, the specific one is M6 by 16, like M6 by 18, which we already use in the universal assays. So, okay. All right, then. Um, I think I have um, some of those screws that I have. Yeah, or take, take an extra yeah. one for where you don't really need it. Yeah. Sure. Uh -huh. um, yeah, so I um, feel like I have a, a better grasp on um, how it's actually assembled. I downloaded the um, 3D model, which yeah. is pretty cool. Um, so it looks pretty nice, and um, hopefully, uh, once it's uh, assembled, um, you know, the, uh, the, Z, the Z model and everything um, is a little easier to work with. Um, but yeah, I, I am interested in um, also playing around with that. Um, I don't remember exactly what it's called, but the, the um, stepping of the of the Z height uh, during the my step. Of the okay, okay. Yeah, I actually so. need to bring that up. I was promised to talk about that. I prepared some material on that, so I'll, I'll cover that. Um, but before I do that, uh, John or John, anything else? Um. Yeah, um, the MES stuff. So we made some good progress in that. Okay. Um, um. So, yeah, uh, let's see what I got there. It's on the uh, I slide pedaling to it. Okay. The uh, MES core dispatch. Oh. So, kind of what's going on here. Uh, MES SDS. Oh, I took there. And head down to um, modules. Modules. Uh, modules for lives. So we're core control 4.2 uh, core control process. In that core dispatch service. The link. There you go. Okay, so what's what's going on here? Based on design, the background of this uh, whole system, and uh, uh, when we do this, kind of have uh, planning and flow charts that come up on Google Drive. You'll see there. Um, they're just uh, starting to gel a bit. I'm thinking about how I'm gonna do this. Just me thinking out loud, kind of in the initial design phase here. Nice. So, but basically, what's gonna happen is we're gonna have to me, this is gonna be uh, SQL driven. Um, you're going to have a, a SQL back that's going to keep track of um, tables for um, instance products. Here's the products we have. Here's like a unique ID for a product, like say a universal access 12 inch, right? That'll be a product. Someone places an order for that. 
And so basically, they will say, well, I will write to the SQL table, hey, uh, I want this one of this product. And so basically, in SQL, what you end up having is you have a whole bunch of foreign keys and such. So you, you can imagine there's a order a table that has products, and there's a database table that has um, customers. And what happens in SQL is you have things called foreign keys. And so that order placed by the website, you're going to have these views where you're able to see and say, hey, we have a, um, this customer bought this many of this, and it kind of gels all those different um, tables of data together, and something that's some easily understand and query might not actually hold any data. So you know, some of this stuff here help uh, make more sense of that to anyone who watching that. Um, but um, basically what's going to happen is you receive an order, and uh, that the website's going to have to pawn it in. Basically, after that's done, any MES out there has just basically a super loop, a machine or some sort of process going to scan, perform various activities that you can define for it to watch something. So this is going to watch the table and it's going to be like, okay, I'm going to check. It's going to have different tasks and checks. I'm checking the horse table. Okay, there's a new order that hasn't shipped yet. And then it's going to do stuff such as like checking another table that has the tasks and then it's the tasks that can be done for a prepping process. It's going to tell, it's going to start other processes. So I think the easiest way to explain this to everybody is just start with a uh, quick example. Um, so maybe on my I need a page in the meeting on the slide, I have a example since we're thinking about. So I didn't quite type it out yet. So and a order table. Then if something hasn't been shipped, then it's okay, well, what do they want? They want one quantity of this product. And so that's that's so gonna go to um, a process that's gonna say, okay, it's going to process that product file and decide what we have in stock. Do you already have you know in the inventory table we already have the product? If we do, send it over and ship it and send a process that handles logistics moving from one point to another. Yeah, I know this is all kind of like scattered together, but uh, I'm, the point is for everyone to know that hey, I'm working on the flow charts and the process flows, and I'm going to be up there throughout this week. That's like this yeah. together, but you know, I had to have this done to be documented. And so what's done is the ability to have a website right to the table, and the bottom line is have it sent out to Octobrand, which will run 3D printer and print part. So you have order, we'll have printers you have available, and then print the parts. It's going to be a Linux statement, and it's going to keep track of all of your shipments, all of your orders, all of your customers. It's going to be a SQL table. And I think that makes sense. Like, here's an order, it's going to have customer, it's going to have all these things, and then it's going to say shipped. And then, you know, another thing, this whole system just tracking where stuff is, like, okay, shipped to the address of the address the customer. Where it's currently being 3D printed, it's currently these parts of this 3D printer. And so it's going to track all these different parts and it's, it's going to basically enable a person to work with that, their home factory and move parts, assemble things, and keep track of the chaos of tons of customers coming in. Or have robots, conveyance, what do they want to do? Take care of the process automatically. But these kind of data systems are essential for anything to be done. Does a user see the on front end, have to understand MySQL, or that's just back end? Um, that's that's going to be back end. They can use it as something that it allows them to use for SQL here as well. They can query and they can, hey, how, how much you know, has customer bought? I'm going to send them like a gift card or something. Or what would what this person order? Oh, they ordered these. Oh, well, I had an issue of production to say, I need to tell this customer is an issue with this product. So it allows them to work with SQL. But the front end, there's really not going to be right. at all. Just like, like on, on the wiki, we don't have to worry about Maria database, or which is a derivative of MySQL and open source version. We just use the wiki. So yeah, I guess it's the same thing. <laughs> You're not going to see anything. I mean, you're yeah. basically what's going to happen is we use a platform called um, Anaconda to distribute the Python packages that are going to need to stay. It's going to be right on the background process. You start up from Linux, starts 
and it's going to download and install um, this whole Anaconda. It's just a scientific Python packet management system. Yeah. For, uh, so, yeah, more or less, you're just going to install it. This game is going to run in the background, and they're going to, you know, for the front end, there will be a basic UI for a user, like defining, hey, here's my website, here's my username and password for the website. But, yeah, they'll write orders to the table, and uh, I'm going to maintain, maybe post that my, you know, Mars, if you're open to it, uh, if you have server space, uh, that's in the table you need for you to maintain our part of the description language files mm-hmm. and all that stuff, basically. And all these people are going to be pulling from that public shirt between distributed enterprise partners data. And you're going to pull from that and send it to your factory. And, you know, of course, you and I would talk and also talk about how to certify something to be a new part or a new product. But mm-hmm. I think you have to buy the order and see it. Of support printer that would go out to it and print and manage your process. Nice. All right. Okay. Oh, good. Glad you're working on it. So keep that yeah, all. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Excellent. Um, anything, Jen? Um, Mark from Democracy Lab has reached out to me about doing a half fun that's a week from Saturday. And I thought instead of trying to do a coding thing, that I would look for people to work on the wiki because that's something we talked about how that's not actually free of Wikipedia. It's like maybe we can find volunteers to work on the wiki. And also, um, for the hack, it doesn't necessarily have to be a coding thing. Try to get people who are experienced in different kinds of outreach to look at the project and help us think of ways to promote it and get people using our um, resources. That was my hackathon idea. Mm-hmm. And I think that'll work really well, and I would be really confident doing that. Um, so I went back to the Global AI Conference last week, which I didn't think was exciting until last day when I went to a workshop on blockchain and AI convergence, and that was really interesting. Um, I met a few developers. I still need to follow up with them, you know, but I've got emails from people that are interested in the project, possibly. And then, as I mentioned before, I, to you, Martin, I ran into the woman who runs the Seattle chapter of Black Girls Code, yeah. and it wouldn't have to necessarily be like something that directed, but then it occurred to me there are so many kids groups dedicated to coding, that, and they are NGOs, right, so they can get government money, but it's not us trying to break into schools, but that would be a lot easier, um, not, not, not to use as a, as a financial resource, but to, to, it would be an easier way to get into the population of youth. Mm-hmm. The open source ideology. Yeah. What is it uh, for the hackathon that you mentioned? We're going to get people working on a wiki? I sure hope so. They have to show up wanting to work on a wiki, but wouldn't that be great? Yeah. I mean, what particular things were you thinking of? Like, well, I haven't got that far yet. I only just thought of this. I just got email, you know, and I've been really super busy. Um, but definitely working on the wiki, but I also think if I could get people who do different, you know, different kinds of outreach, because it, it's not all necessarily people who are coding who show up, but people who want to code, they have other skills, get them working on, on the outreach, because we're, I, I feel like they're, this is such an amazing project, and we're not explaining it well enough, and we're not telling enough people about it. Yeah, yeah. You know, and I, and I, and I, and even if we don't get any really fabulous ideas, at least I would get a bunch of people who are dedicated, you know, who do that professionally or whatever, who would be thinking about it and maybe they're telling their friends. At least it, it, would, it would be like a hopefully at work effect. Yeah. One thing that definitely be a candidate for, for doing work on the wiki, like for example, when we have all our CAD files for the things we do, like say the 3D printer, a lot of the yeah. parts. It's like it's almost kind of grunt work, but it's very important. Just simply generating, right. generating uh, dimensional drawings from parts that we have. Like say we got a tractor, or whatever the the power cube, whatever. Just taking an existing CAD drawing, and there's a page on the way called um, fabrication drawings. And we've got just a limited number of them, but. So simple fabric, sample fabrication drawing from FreeCAD. You just take 
if you see my screen, it's like, okay, here's the axis, and uh -huh. this, this comes right out of Freak. I mean, it's very easy to learn, because all you need to do is you, you open up your file, you project it in mm -hmm. three different views, and then you just start drawing a bunch of these arrows and bubbles. It's kind of fun, because you, cause you get this complex-looking thing with all the dimensions. Because cause it's important, like, when you reference this, say you're designing it, you want to know oh, how long was, was that piece there, whatever, to make things fit. These things are very useful. So to have that for every single part that we do use is actually, uh, it's almost busy work, but it's not. It's, it's really important because you want to reference that sometimes. You don't want to like go into FreeCAD, just open FreeCAD and try to find that dimensional free that you want to have it referenced somewhere. Right. Like for example, now, if you go to say, um, See, this, this, is, this is a project that I absolutely completely understand and would be confident presenting. Yeah, yeah, like, uh, awesome. so if you look at, for example, the D3D V1904 page that I'm looking at right now, you got the part library, but next to our parts, we could have, like, say you have the gallery for the frame, you could have, like, the next gallery pieces, okay, now here is the, the dimensional drawing. Right. That's very useful. Yeah, it would. Yeah. Because they can see, it's, well, like, the drawing itself, the, the visual out it's like that doesn't tell you anything but once you have dimension next to it that's that's a real formable technical drawing that people can use uh, different yeah right so that's the idea that's worthwhile to get get that for everything we have no that, that, that does sound fun and that would be absolutely perfect for people who are trying to start out with that yeah, yeah try to see if you can you get them to do that awesome thank you all right, so I'm, I'm going to just go on to the last thing that I pressed last week, which was um, talking about what is the procedure for getting a printer for the first first run, the first run on the printer, right? Uh, which is relevant right now. Eric, you mentioned about baby stepping correction, and, and Ruslan uh, talked about getting his printer up and running. So, so there's a, I put a page with three printer. Yeah, John, you too, everybody. This is, because it's really nice and streamlined, but I get I haven't communicated well enough. Here. So it's 3D printer. Printer first print. Here's the foolproof way to get your perfect print on first try. So the introduction is there's three main steps. You gotta one, you gotta build a printer and build it according to instructions. So, uh, like for example, uh, let, let's take Rusan since he's, he's the case in point. He asked for like how do you get this thing calibrate again? So build a printer. So assume you got all the module put back together, install the software. And then use the baby typing correction. So, on building the printer, there's just a couple of main points. For one, we have a 3D printer manual that get, goes through in detail about everything. Now, in the 3D per final assembly, and it'll direct like that, that's like the most important part of the manual because it shows you how to put all the modules together and how to align them and everything. And on page 50 of the 3D per final assembly, it shows you how you do the testing so all of the motion of the axes, so they're moving in the right directions. Now, once you have the printer assembled and moving correctly, then you just simply have to go to the to the software. And if you want, like, all gory details, all the six different chapters, mod by mod, are found in the, in the assembly document, the, the 3D printer manual, to give you all the details of the build. So now, let's talk about the software. Uh, so, first of all, let's see Marlin. We need to use OSC version 18.10 or later. So that's actually all right. That's why you, you haven't done this yet because you did 1808, I believe. So go to the OSC Marlin page and OSC Marlin 18.10 and later has 18.10 um, is the first one where you use the baby stepping correction, which means the LC screen, so LCD screen is now in common use, though actually, Rus wait, Ruslan, I guess, now that I think about it, I don't think we had the LCD screen at that time. Ah, okay, so Ruslan, you're gonna need to get yourself an LCD screen uh, for your printer, because then you can, uh, the way it works is that upon first print, use the knob, you select, you start first print, and you click select, and then you move the head up and down, so that you see exactly where the head is touching the bed. If it's too high or too low, and just adjust it very finely with an knob until you know that it's at the right angle, because you're seeing that the prints are hearing properly. And that's pretty much all you need. Now, let's, let's talk a little bit more. So, one is um, download the 
um, Marlin 18.10. The 18.10 version has the 0.4 millimeter nozzle. The later version, which is 1902, that is uh, dedicated for 0.8 millimeter nozzle. But the, the nozzle side, that, that cuts the heat change. Uh, so after you upload the Marlin 1810 or larger, the, the fine tuning happens in in OSC Cura. So um, regarding OSC Cura, so install software. You got Marlin 18.1 or higher, and then get OSC Cura. Okay, let's click on OSC Cura. So what is the difference between OSC Cura, Cura, and Lulzbot Cura? <laughs> so you have to understand the distinction between those, and the simple thing is, Cura came out by Ultimaker, that's the original software, and Lulzbot, our favorite tree printing company, their open source, converted that to a Linux dedicated version, which is just runs faster on Linux and all. That's really nice, good interface. I mean, you can still use the original Cura from Ultimaker, which Ultimaker, they produced open source software Cura, but their hardware itself is closed, so you know, that part we don't like. We like the Cura. Now, Cura, I think, to Lulzbot have been uh, reformulated for Linux in an ideal way. If you try to use original Cura, it will run, but it'll be slower. Uh, just a pain. Now, what is the OSC Cura? So, OSC Cura is the same as Lulzbot Cura, except we're using printer profiles for the D3D printer. So, that's just the thing. So, OSC Cura is what comes out of the box from Lulzbot Cura when you download Lulzbot, Lulzbot Cura from the Lulzbot site. Except you're not using the printer settings or profiles, but using the dimensions and everything else about that's related to the D3D OSC version. So that's that. Uh, on a page called OSC Cura, I also put some notes there regarding all of that which I just said in the about section. Yeah, you for me, in my case, have this tech is uh, how I can uh, modify those settings for my. That's different than the standard. Okay, so so the page D3D Lulzbot Cure, which should really be OSC Lulzbot Cure, so make it more general. Uh, OSC Lulzbot Cure or D3D Lulzbot Cure, same thing. Um, so there's different places where you configure a printer, and that, that page goes through that. So one is machine settings in Lulzbot Cure. You can select bed size, nozzle size, presence of heat, the machine settings, uh, etc. There's a second place where you change things about the printer. There's the configuration file, the INI file in Lulzbakura itself. And then the third place is Marlin firmware. But you can also see that once we've got the LCD screen, I'm going to add another one that's, that's the LCD screen, because you can actually input values in LCD, the LCD screen and then save them. Uh, so input values and save them. So, for example, like print speed or even things like acceleration or, I don't think it has nozzle size in the, in the menu, but it has things like the Z offset, like for calibration, like the initial Z offset, it has the baby step, and it's got a lot of different things in there, you can save those. Um, like, for example, you know, I mean, you can modify temperatures, you only save so many things. Is that the problem? The RAM. EEPROM. The LC screen, uh, when you hit save, then the LCD screen will save it to the EEPROM of the Arduino. There's this tiny bit there. Yeah. Yep. So there's certain things you can save on the LC screen. Now, what you need to pay attention to within Cura, Cura is kind of like where you pretty much set up everything. Because once you've got the correct Marlin, which you uploaded, you don't go back there. That's, that's good. So don't worry about that. You can kind of forget it. So what you really have to worry about is the LCD screen and then, then uh, Cura. Now Cura, you can click. Okay, I'm going to open up Cura here. Cura. I'll show you what I mean by that. So in Cura, you can save the configuration file. So once you put in, you can put in all the different settings like speeds and, you know, temperatures and diameter the filament and everything so you can open up little bug here so you can do that at home in the file menu there's a thing called open profile or save profile so once you have put in all your eyes for example uh, nozzle size i mean that's the first thing you're going to take a look at 
nozzle size, you have 0.4 right here. Um, and then you go to like layer height, you have 0.31, that's right now. It has to be smaller than the nozzle size, because you can't be printing in there. Um, but it's like that. So after you've got all the different values here, you, you save, you go to File, Save Profile, and then you can have a send file that has all the correct settings that you want for your printer to run forever. Unless you want to change things like maybe you want to add bread or add support or whatever. Uh, all those things will be saved in the settings file. So when you open up Cura again, it, it'll typically retain your last file, rat last settings. But if you want to restart those settings, you just, you just go to File, Open Profile. And that is the .imi file that you use. So, so there it is. Um, so that's that's the main things like like for but okay one thing I will point out is also start and end G code. So Cura, uh, what Cura allows you to do is you drag your drop, drag and drop your STL file, and you can save that to a G code file for your LCD screen. It will save whatever you have in the start and end G code as well into your G code file. So so basically in the start. G code file, which I'm in right now, you can basically put in a bunch of commands that will override whatever you have saved anywhere else. Like, for example, here, um, I, I do M92 E425, that means 425 steps per milliliter on the extruder, so that's basically like configuring how, the, how fast the extruder drives filament. That's typically in Marlin, you can set that in Marlin, but here you can override it. So basically what I'm saying is that you can override a bunch of things that you put in Marlin um, in this start G code that basically will make the extruder go 425 steps per millimeter of filament extruded. So that's the one thing you have to pay attention to. Make sure that nothing in your start and end G code is overriding something else that you have elsewhere. So it's, it's just a little trick. But if you read the page, uh, just read the D3D little spot cure page in detail because I point out all these things there. Um, and the main thing is like for the Titan Arrow, you have 425 steps per millimeter. For the Prusaif MK2 extruder, we had 161.3. Uh, for the original one, the MK8s, I think it was 100 or something like that, but it worked. It was like totally not using that. But it's all there. So, so take a look at that. Now we've calibrated that. And all that. Okay, so you've got the right software. You download. So I'm going back to the first print. Uh, so now here's the main thing: first print with live baby stepping correction. What that means is that after you've got the correct software and you're using Cura to say either to plug into Cura with a USB stick, USB line, or just uh, generate a G file that you save on a little SD card that you put into your LCD screen. Uh, you've got the file that you want to print with the correct settings and everything else. So that there. And you know your printer is moving, so now you have to worry about, okay, uh, am I going to hit the print first layer? Like, how do I tell the printer where the first layer is? So here's the procedure, and this is foolproof, and you could get it the first time around. Um, so here it is. So we like to work with the test cube. It's just a simple 10 millimeter cube, so download from the 10 millimeter calibration cube. Uh, so that's the link there. Um, pr quick test of printer performance to get a first uh, layer. So basically, you're going to put into your... Uh, now, you go to... This is dedicated for the... You have to have the LC screen. Do this one time, maybe stepping correction. So that's that's where, for Ruslan, I would recommend doing that. It will cost you 10 bucks, 10 or $15 to get an LCD screen. It just makes it so much easier. Like, it will allow you to do the first print on first try as opposed to having to do, like... You know, if you're lucky, you'll do it in an hour for the first time. Cause you'd be just missing the first print. You stop the print, look, heat up again, do the print again, trying to see if the Z, Z height is, is good. But here, you, you correct it in real time. So what you do within the LCD screen, and you just have to you know, turn on your LCD screen, go to... The um, LCD will come here. I want to you know, turn things off, but um, it's, it's just kind of further calibrating that. Um, okay, so this is related to that. It's not, it's where you're actually telling it. So, okay, so let's explain this. I kind of know, but I think that might be good. Yes, yes. Let's explain how this works. So, what the printer does 
is it has within Marlet's program to do this bed probing where it will uh, go down on the bed at multiple points and it'll stop where the height probe, the Z probe, triggers. So there's a Z probe on a printer next to the extruder which detects metal, and detects your metal print surface. So if you're uh, approaching the print surface, the Marlin will, will probe at multiple points to get a prof basically a height map of the print print bed. So if it's slanted anywhere, it'll tell you where it's how far it has to go down before it hits a bed. Uh, so that's called auto bed leveling within Marlin. You have a procedure where it probes the 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 three printer probe the bed by moving the head down until it hits at multiple points so it gets a height map of the print bed. So that is great, but there's a little trick to that in that you don't know the relationship between where the probe is set because it's screwed in. It's just physically somewhere. You have to know where in relationship to the muzzle it is in terms of Z height. You don't know when it's going to trigger. You don't know precisely when it's going to trigger. You want to be like paper with off bed surface. So right. That's allows us to just fine tune that in. It allows us, you know, you don't know when that bed's going to trigger. Let's set the height of that probe. Right. But you don't know it. You make that offset. Yeah. So there's two steps to, to setting that. One is you have to first just get it in general in the right location. Now, the first question, uh, which is an obvious question, is the probe going to be, the physical tip of the probe going to be above or below the nozzle? Well, obvious answer there, it's going to have to be above, because if it is below the nozzle, then the probe would hit before the nozzle, which is the bed, and you would always be printing in air. So, first of all, make sure that the, the, the probe physical tip of the probe, which is the blue tip of the probe, is above the level of the nozzle. How much? Well, we're using a probe that's got an 8 millimeter sensing distance. So upon steel, for the steel bed, which our beds right now, they can have either steel or aluminum bed place, they detect metals. For aluminum, it will detect anywhere from about 0 to 4 millimeters off the bed. For steel, it would detect anywhere between 0 and about 8 millimeters because the steel is, you can see steel better. But Pro is a fat one. It's, the one we're using is not like most 3D printers. We're using an 8 millimeter distance sensing probe to give us more leeway so that we can be higher off the print bed. In other words, prevent the probe from ever hitting the prints. We can be higher up safely above the prints while still being able to detect the bed, which is especially relevant if you've got very large printers and uh, make sure you don't mess up anywhere. Um, so the 8 millimeter sensing uh, sensor is dedicated for easier to adjust because it's got more uh, sensing distance. Otherwise, the thin ones, they're like, they're more like 4 millimeter sensing, which or aluminum means like two millimeters, and two millimeters is pretty small. So four millimeters gives much more safety, and that's why, like, if you know some i3 and K2, they've got this little protector for the probe, so it's like a bumper, so so it protects the probe, so you don't hit the probe and knock it off. But I get rid of that. Just use a larger probe. You can keep it higher above the bed. That that's an easy solution. Uh, it's just a little larger, but. Um, what? Let's yeah, of course. There's a lot of press. Um, I'll be using it for startling mechanically. It's like I did. Like, just try to get the nozzle close to the bed. And right. that sense, you now get the trip right at the nozzle just above that. Like, repeating with. You can do that with your eye. And that can help make sure your you know, Z stop sensor is in any millimeter to stop. Start, and then, you know, you get your precise value after you do this. But if you start with it, at least. In the ballpark to help so you're not having to do it over again or just move yeah it yeah it's exactly the idea is that just get the probe to be like a couple of milli two four you know four millimeters two it's actually you want it to be 
one millimeter above the, the, the blue tip of the probe wants to be about a millimeter or two above the tip of the nozzle. Um, now, what you do then is, so then you can hit print actually. So if you if you physically uh, hang your your sensor, which is a mechanical device, no, well, it's an electromechanical device, but, but it's mounted. You, you control how you mount it. It's mounted one or two millimeters above the nozzle. The, the, the common suggestion is one millimeter. For us, it can be fine, fine if it's two because we've got a large nozzle. So make sure it's just above the nozzle. So then you hit print. And upon the first print, so does its own bed level where it probes the bed, the nozzle. Um, then it starts printing and it, it may or may not hit the bed. So you, 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 you hit your LCD screen controller. You go to baby stepping correction. You figure out where that is in a menu. It's, you figure it out. Uh, and then you rotate it left or right. Make the nozzle go higher or lower. And just leave it at the place where it's exactly at the surface of the of the print surface and you will notice on a screen that's you might be like a negative 1.2 or something like that it means you have to move the the nozzle down um let's say 1.2 so now you take that value which you have to move move down and you set that as a new value of the z offset so what i didn't mention here yet is that i'm kind of jumping is um you have to start with inputting uh, this random one or two millimeter height on the Z offset from extruder. That's a setting within the LCD screen. So you get that Z offset from extruder, set it to say negative one. So it means the probe is one millimeter above um, the nozzle. So you set that to one, say negative one. Upon baby, set, baby step correction, you have turned the knob to get, get the nozzle exactly on the bed and just read that value if it's like negative one one point two let's say that means you move it down another one two milli millimeters before it hit the actual bed so what that means is that uh let the print finish and uh, you should print a good good thing to calibration cue that should succeed but at that point uh, you know while it's still printing you can still go into the menu and say okay uh modify your Z probe offset for extruder. So you start with negative one. Well, you just move negative one point two. So now it's a total two point negative two point two. So put in two point two with the dial that in on the LCD screen and save saved EEPROM. So after you save it, the next print, it will find exactly that place where the nozzle is right on on the surface. That's it. Done. Period. Try it. Get on the first time, love. I mean, it's it's pretty easy. It's uh, but you have to just make sure that you uh, once you find out what that Z offset value is by turning the, the baby stepping correction left to right, you just add that to your former Z offset, and that's described on the page. So it's 3D printer first print. I'm gonna paste that just in case you didn't catch that. Uh, 3D printer first print. I put that into the the main notes. As well as, I'm going to put that into the notes on a work document. So, first, print correction. So, there it is. Read the details. Uh, you can read the details on that page. Because I kind of went through it, but I'm doing that. I'm just going through those points there, uh, step by step, on the wiki. So, just take a look at that. And it should be a foolproof way on the first try, basically, as long as, you know, your nozzle, your, no, your, um, as long as your sensor is above the nozzle, and it's like a one or two millimeters above, then you just fine tune it using these baby stepping directions. You then save it in the menu. It saves an EEPROM. It's there forever. And only, you might change it only if you print printer gets untuned or you, know, you bomb it or whatever but it should save for many prints um but do that with the like but okay one thing you have to watch out for though is if it's not heated that value might be a little different so so it's, it's that value of, of correction is valid for the same conditions that you do so for example if you don't heat the bed Heating will move the bed around a little bit move it like a millimeter or so so if you're not say you turned off your heat bed you might get a different um, offset from extruder. So that's the only caveat. 
Other than that, if you're printing under the same conditions, that value of Z offset should be good forever. Uh, until the next time you have to calibrate, if you, something goes up. So that's that's about it. And uh, that's it for the procedure. Um, so I'll do that. that. But refer to the... Does that, that test relative to a... Uh, I just I guess one point on that, because then sometimes they... Well, it looked like the paper test was a common thing on some printers, and it, the beds, of course, are not perfect. So some beds, you you want to test multiple points and yeah. things like that. And is yeah, that the, a number? The, okay. um, it's just one height setting, right? And uh, yeah. that That's gets the stepping right, and, and I assume it's for a particular nozzle size and, and layer height. And all that, right? So, no, it's universal for everything. It's, it's so, unless you're, uh, yeah, like it's pretty much universal. Like, if you use a 0.4 millimeter nozzle, your leeway is a little smaller, but say you print with a 1.2 millimeter nozzle, that should still work on the, you should still find the back yeah. properly. Now, the, so, the paper paper test is for when you don't have the baby stepping correction, so the paper st test is, is the old stuff. But note that the probing happens at multiple points, but the initial Z offset, you just need one value for that. The, pro the probing happens at multiple points, but the Z offset is just one step otherwise. The key thing to offset here from the note, it's just literally the distance between the tip of the nozzle and the distance yep. between the nozzle and the tip of the sensor. Yep. Um, relative to when the sensor triggers, this is just that. That's all. That's really at yeah. play here. Hey guys, I uh, actually gotta get going because I got a meeting at, at three thirty exactly. So I'm gonna cut off, and uh, so we'll talk next. Ask me if you have any questions. I gotta run, but it's good otherwise. We'll, we'll see you soon. All right. So let me just reset this. Hi, Steve. Okay, we're, we're just uh, wrapping up with uh, our last team meeting here. But yeah, Steve, so uh, yeah, glad to talk to you. Uh, I can't hear you, though, on the... Can you hear me now? Okay, I can hear you now. Yep. Yeah. Yep. I hadn't talked. I hadn't talked yet. <laughs> okay. Okay. Sounds How's good. How's it going? Uh, pretty good. I'm pretty inspired. Um, things are good. I w yeah, yeah. How about, how about yourself? Oh, it's good. I know it's funny. The week uh, of Ted is always a. Um, I mean, you've been, so you know.